Joseph Wu is the Foreign Minister of Taiwan. Minister Wu, thank you so much for giving us your time. It's much appreciated. It's my pleasure. Do you feel threatened by mainland China right now? Yes. Uh, the answer is rather simple. Uh, if you look at the Chinese military activities around Taiwan, uh, it is a threat and it's very threatening. Uh, just give you some examples. Uh, on September 23rd, you know, just a few days ago, uh, the Chinese sent uh, 24 military aircraft uh, through Bashi Channel, the southern, type, uh, southern part of Taiwan, uh, to simulate attacks on our bases uh, on the east and the uh, southeast side. And they not only do that on September 23rd, they have done that before. And other than the uh, overt military threat, uh, they have also done the infiltrations, you know, set up, set up uh, their cronies inside Taiwan. Uh, they do a lot of uh, disinformation campaign. Uh, they also do hybrid warfare and on uh, many other fronts. Uh, they also try to block Taiwan's participation in international activities or international organizations. They try to prevent Taiwan from having better relations with other countries. So if you look at uh, the relations between Taiwan and China, uh, China has been threatening Taiwan and the threat seems to be more serious than before. But threats and intimidation are one thing. Do you believe that Xi Jinping would actually act on those threats? Uh, that is something that we have been watching very carefully. Uh, in you know, real life world, there's not a black and white situation, but we are very concerned that China is going to launch a war against Taiwan at some point, uh, even though the threat may not be imminent at this point, but there might be some conditions uh, that China may use force against Taiwan. Uh, for instance, if their internal situation is getting uh, more serious than before, and in the very classical way of understanding about the authoritarianism, they might launch a crisis externally in order to divert domestic attention. So in the recent uh, power regime or power outages in China, that is something that we have been observing very carefully because we are concerned if the domestic discontent or economic slowdown is getting very serious, Taiwan might become a target of this authoritarianism to divert its domestic attention. Here's the other thing that could precipitate just such an attack, and that would be if Taiwan made any formal moves towards independence. Would you rule that out right now, or is that something that could still happen in the future? Uh, I will explain to you in a very frank way. Uh, Taiwan is a democracy, and therefore, Taiwan's government need to observe and follow the majority view and the majority view here in Taiwan very consistently throughout the uh, uh, public opinion surveys. The people here want to maintain the status quo. And that is our commitment ever since we took power. And therefore, we want to be committed to the status quo. But Minister, that's been shifting. Yes, the numbers are in favour of the status quo right now. But amongst younger people, there is a much stronger independence feeling. Do you believe that that could become a majority sentiment in the country? Uh, I think this is a very subtle question and it deserves a uh, more subtle answer uh, to that question. Uh, if you look at the situation here in Taiwan, uh, I'm sure you would agree with me that Taiwan is not under any country's jurisdiction. We elect our own government democratically and the government here in Taiwan is being exercising exclusive jurisdiction over the territory and its control. And therefore, if you look at the situation here in Taiwan, Taiwan is not part of any other country. And this is the reality. So no matter whether the young people think that we should pursue independence or many people will tell you that we would like to preserve the status quo, I think this is the reality majority of the people here in Taiwan want to maintain. You say that Taiwan is not under the control of any other country, but it's also true, isn't it, that not many countries in the world recognise Taiwan. Most countries, Australia and the United States included, recognise a one-China policy. That's the People's Republic of China. So they don't have international recognition to support you. Uh, that is true. Uh, but according to international law, the uh, most prominent international law about the status or the uh, definition of a country, 
diplomatic recognition is not one of those conditions. Uh, the conditions of being independent or being a country is that there is a territory and there's a government. The government is exercising the jurisdiction over the territory. So under these kinds of definition, you know, Taiwan is in fact a country uh, with the formal title, the Republic of China. Uh, even though we do not have uh, diplomatic recognition by the most important countries in the world, but we do have very substantial unofficial relations with each other. And to us, that is great. For example, our relations with uh, Australia, uh, the officials in between the two sides have been interacting with each other substantially, and we trade with each other substantially. And when it comes to Taiwan's participation in international organizations or international activities, the Australian government is always one of those who will stand up for Taiwan. And uh, when it comes to peace and stability over the Taiwan Strait, Australia is also one of those countries that will come out consistently insisting that peace and stability is very important in the Taiwan Strait area. You say that Australia would stand up for Taiwan, but would you seriously expect that Australia would defend Taiwan, put troops on the ground in the event of an attack from China? Uh, that is a hypothetical question. But, sir, that may not be a hypothetical question. You've said that you fear an attack and that you're preparing for an invasion. So, again, I ask you, would Australia be expected to fight alongside you? Uh, it's our policy uh, that we would uh, defend ourselves by ourselves. Taiwan is absolutely committed to defend itself. So whether there's going to be a war or not, we will continue to strengthen our defense capabilities in safeguarding our own democracy, safeguarding our own, our own sovereignty. So that is the bottom line. Uh, but of course, uh, when there's a crisis, uh, if the Australian government can go along with other major partners of ours and tell China that uh, the invasion, the war is not right, uh, that will be highly appreciated. Uh, if you look at the uh, Australian uh, actions and statement recently, uh, that is something that we would expect and that is something that we really appreciate. You know, for example, in the Japan, Australia 2 plus 2, in France, Australia 2 plus 2, uh, in Osman 2021 and etc. And also in, G20, uh, in, in the, uh, the uh, Quad uh, ministerial uh, statement. Australia is always the one who is very firm in stating that uh, it is very important to maintain peace and stability over the Taiwan Strait. And that shows uh, Australia's commitment uh, to the peace and stability in this region. And if you allow me to take a few more steps further, during this period of time, uh, in the absence of war, uh, we see that Taiwan and Australia are great partners. We share the same value. You know, we believe in freedom and democracy and rule of law, and we also believe in free and open and peaceful, stable and prosperous Indo-Pacific. And in this region, Taiwan and Australia are great partners, and we also trade with each other substantially. And that is also putting Taiwan and Australia in the same interest. Uh, other than that, Taiwan is a significant bastion for the production of uh, computer chips. And if Taiwan is under attack, I'm sure the world is going to feel the impact. And therefore, uh, I believe that the Australian government is going to uh, come up with its own assessment to see what is the best way to prevent China from launching attacks against Taiwan. And it's my belief that the Australian government continuously to mention the importance of peace and stability over the Taiwan Strait is the best way to deal with it. But, Minister, words are not going to be enough, are they? Just recently on this program, we had a figure in China who is very influential saying specifically that he does not believe that the United States or any other country would actually sacrifice itself, shed blood in defence of Taiwan. Words won't be enough to deter China. Uh, I think you might be right. Uh, but we also understand the situation. We understand our own situation. The defense of Taiwan is in our own hands, and we are absolutely committed to that. And if China is going to launch a war against Taiwan, we will fight to the end, and that is our commitment. And of course, during this period of time, we would like to exchange with other countries for security cooperation. Uh, for example, our security relations with the United States have been improving uh, we have been conducting dialogues 
in order for us to understand the kinds of strategy, the kind of preparation we need to do in order for us to be able to successfully defend ourselves. And we also try to procure uh, military articles, defensive articles from the United States so that we are able to defend ourselves. And we would like to engage in security or intelligence exchanges with other like-minded partners, Australia included, so that Taiwan is better prepared to deal with the war situation. And so far, our relations with Australia is very good, and that is what we appreciate it for. When you say that you would successfully defend yourself, the reality is, isn't it, that you would be massively outgunned. China has the biggest army in the world, the biggest navy in the world. It's continuing to pump more money into its military year on year. How could you possibly win a war against such overwhelming odds? Uh, I think that might be a wrong assessment. Uh, our military uh, is quite capable. Uh, it's not like Afghanistan at all. Uh, Taiwan's military, even though it's uh, uh, being described as uh, you know, having a significant gap with the Chinese military, but we are not totally defenseless. We also have our own Navy, we have our own Air Force, and we have also prepared uh, asymmetric uh, strategy in dealing with China, and we also produce our own defense articles. Uh, I cannot elaborate on that, and I'm sure if China is uh, going to launch an attack against Taiwan. I think they are going to suffer tremendously as well. So that is our commitment. We are willing to defend ourselves. And if you look at the uh, philosophical side, Taiwan is a democracy. And we are very proud to have this democracy. And the people here in Taiwan enjoy freedom. And this is something that we want to defend for. And the Taiwanese government and the Taiwanese people, Taiwanese military, are committed to defend this way of life. And we understand our resp responsibility is not just Taiwan. Our responsibility is to defend freedom and democracy for the rest of the democratic world. And we are committed to that. Even though Taiwan is small, but you know, think about the uh, David versus Goliath. We believe that democracy at the end is going to prevail and Taiwan is going to prevail. I wanted to get your thoughts on the AUKUS agreement and whether you support Australia acquiring nuclear-powered submarines, something that China has said is a provocative act. Uh, I'm not sure about the real situation in 2040 when Australia is going to have um, to deploy the first nuclear-powered submarines. But during this period of time, if you look at the dynamics in the Indo-Pacific, uh, we are pleased to see uh, that the like-minded partners of Taiwan, uh, the United States, and the UK, and Australia are working closer with each other uh, to acquire more advanced defensive articles uh, so that we can defend Indo-Pacific, uh, the rule-based international order in this region, and to defend the shared uh, interest in this region. So we are pleased to see that Australia is playing a bigger role and I should say that Australia is a great country. Uh, I visited your great country before, and when uh, I see the you know, landscape of your capital, and when I see the activities of Australia, when I see that Australia is not only a member of Quad, but also a member of AUKUS, and also a member of G20, APEC, and et cetera, Australia is a great country. And I'm very glad to see that Australia is going to shoulder more responsibility to maintain peace and stability in the Indo-Pacific. Would you make a similar agreement? Is this the sort of thing that you're looking for? Would you go to the United States and say, we want that same technology, nuclear-powered submarines, to defend Taiwan? Uh, that is a very good question. Uh, but we have a different war strategy. We need to go asymmetric and we need to have a different type of philosophy in defeating China if there's going to be a war. So nuclear power submarine is not something that we are seeking. I wanted to ask you about the Quad and particularly how you see the roles of Japan and India. Of course, they have other competing interests and they have other agreements and alliances and cooperation with a whole range of other countries. Do you believe that the Quad is really watertight? Do you believe that this is a clear-cut block of democracies that could hedge against China's rise? Uh, Quad is not a security pact, uh, as the members uh, 
Australia included, has been saying. Uh, and I think Quad's purpose, as being stated in the summit, is very clear. Uh, that uh, the uh, four countries are going to be committed to work with each other on supply chain, on climate change, on uh, the high tech uh, and the joint fight against uh, COVID-19 and et cetera. And we think it's a wonderful thing that the four major democracies surrounding Indo-Pacific are working with each other to provide support for each other and to su supply support for other countries in this region. So I, uh, when I look at quad uh, cooperation and statement coming out, I think it's a good thing. It's it's great to have Japan and uh, India uh, to play a more significant significant role. And of course, every country has a different role to play in this world, and we respect uh, the way they look at their own role in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, India uh, is committed to its uh, national development, and it still has that core strategy of non-alignment. And we can perfectly respect that, uh, but we are also trying to develop closer ties with India, uh, whether it's in economic aspect or political aspect or in other aspects. And our relations are moving ahead. And when it comes to Japan, our relations with, with Japan is just wonderful. We have so many friends uh, in uh, Japan. You know, when we apply for the CPTPP. Uh, see the Japanese politicians, even the four contenders for the presidency of uh, LDP, all come out and say they support Taiwan's participation in CPTPP. So our relations with Japan is very unique, uh, but our uh, security relations is not as good as our security relations with the United States. And that is something that we recognize because Japan is limited by their own constitution and et cetera. Uh, let me sum it up. Every country, has its own limitations and every country has its own national motivations and national interests and we respect that but at any rate you know we are making headways in our relations with all four quad members let me ask you about the cptpp of course which is the latest iteration of the trans-pacific partnership taiwan has applied to join australia has said it will cooperate with other members to look at that application without outright supporting it, would you expect more from Australia right now, more explicit support of Taiwan's bid? Well, of course, you know, we want Australian government to be more explicit uh, in supporting Taiwan's uh, participation in the CPTPP or becoming a member of the CPTPP. Uh, but your trade minister has already said it, uh, it to the media and it's been out in the open. And the way I read it is that uh, it's Pretty supported. So we appreciate that very much. And of course, we need to discuss with Australia individually uh, over all uh, trade issues uh, for Australia uh, to be firm on our participation in the CPTPP. And we will seek opportunities to negotiate with Australia individually. When you say negotiate with Australia individually, Australia, of course, has a free trade agreement with mainland China. It does not with Taiwan. Is that something that you would like to pursue? Uh, there are two, two separate things. Uh, the first thing is about, you know, ECA negotiations with Australia. You know, it's not moving ahead, even though this is something that we would aim at. Uh, we talked to uh, the Australian government before, and there's still a prospect for us to negotiate for an ECA uh, or FTA. Uh, another thing is uh, CPTPP. It's another setup. Uh, for Taiwan to become a member of the CPTPP, you know, we need to negotiate with every country individually. And if we are able to meet the requirements of the high standard of the CPTPP, and it's up to individual members to say yes or no to our participation to the CPTPP. And so far, we have been speaking to all 11 members, uh, and hopefully, Taiwan can be accepted by all 11 members, Australia included. But you would like to see Australia take a stronger stand right now and be more openly supportive? Uh, as far as I know, Australia has been uh, one of those uh, uh, most uh, vocal members in supporting Taiwan's participation in CPTPP. Uh, we have been uh, discussing with each other privately for quite some time, and uh, we understand the Australian support and we appreciate the Australian support. Minister Wu, just a final thought from you about this discussion around conflict between China and Taiwan. 
of course, that could be a flashpoint that involves other countries as well. But what is the window that we're talking about here? What's the time frame for any potential invasion, as you would see? Uh, it's hard to predict. And as uh, you know, social scientists or political scientists before, we are saying that prediction may always be very difficult. So I won't make that prediction. Uh, but what we see is that uh, the tension has been rising over the Taiwan Strait. And we are very concerned about the potential for a conflict in between Taiwan and China. And it's our responsibility to maintain peace and stability over the Taiwan Strait. So there are several things we need to do and we are doing. The first is for us to be able to defend ourselves. And we have been trying to beef up our own defense capabilities by procurement, uh, from the United States or by production domestically or by engaging in uh, security or intel cooperations with other countries. We have been doing that. And the second is for Taiwan to become good friends of those like my partners. Uh, we want to develop closer ties with Australia, with Japan, with the United States, with India and with European countries. And we have also been doing that as well. And if you look at the uh, recent statements by various summit, including those uh, Australia involved, uh, G7 summit, US, uh, EU summit or NATO summit and et cetera, they all come to the understanding that peace and stability over the Taiwan Strait is very important. And especially the European countries. Now they have uh, many countries uh, have uh, the uh, Indo-Pacific strategy, even the EU itself, uh, has that Indo-Pacific strategy. And in order for them to implement their Indo-Pacific strategy, they are developing closer economic and political ties with Taiwan. They are also sending their fleet to have uh, the freedom of navigation operations in this region. So our work has been uh, bearing fruit right now, and we will continue to do what we have been doing to develop closer ties with other countries. And we are absolutely committed to our own security. We are absolutely committed to our own defense. And that is our commitment. Minister Wu, again, thank you so much for giving us your time. You are absolutely welcome. Thank you.